Good, very well. Welcome everyone to lecture nine of the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics lecture series. I hope you all had a good holiday break. We are currently discussing measurements in quantum mechanics. But before I go there and give a quick recap of what we've been discussing, just an organizational announcement. There's a new problem sheet uh, available on the, on the wiki, on the homepage of the lecture series. So please go have a look there. And then uh, next week, sometime next week, uh, we can schedule another tutorial session uh, on this problem sheet. So with that, I want to start. And I want to have a very brief recap of what we said last time about quantum measurements. So the simplest kind of quantum measurement would be if you have a two-level system, a qubit, a spin one-half system, which is in a superposition state, and you want to measure the spin in a certain basis. Uh, so for example, the basis of up versus down. And if you couple it to a measurement apparatus, according to the modern theory of quantum measurements, you would describe the whole setup uh, using quantum mechanics, using the Schrödinger evolution. So not only your little quantum system, your spin is described using quantum mechanics, but also the whole apparatus and the interaction between apparatus and system will be described using quantum mechanics. And what happens then is that initially the system, that is the spin and the apparatus were independent in independent quantum states. So the overall state was a product state, but soon enough via the interaction, what uh, this evolves into is a so-called entangled state where the state of the apparatus starts to depend on the state of the system. And this is how you would do the measurement. And this kind of entangled state is shown here. Psi is actually, sorry, Psi is actually this state shown here. So it's still a superposition with a still the same superposition coefficients, alpha and beta as before. But now the up state would be coupled to um, a certain state of the apparatus that belongs to spin up. And this kind of state will look different in different kinds of measurement settings. But in any case, you can formally describe it like this. And correspondingly, spin down would be coupled to another state that belongs to spin down, here called chi down. Now, in the examples we discussed, the simplest example was the stern gerlach apparatus, where you had um, literally a spin flying into a magnetic field that has a gradient. And then it would be deflected upwards or downwards, depending on uh, whether the spin is up or down. And so in the first stage of the measurement process, you would then have these wave functions called chi, the wave functions of the apparatus would simply be the wave function for the orbital motion of the spin. So you would have the spin degree of freedom up versus down, but you would also have the orbital wave function uh, with a, a wave function dependent on position. And in a first stage, uh, you would entangle the spin direction with the position. In a later stage, though, we would have the spin impinging somewhere on a screen. And once in the, it impinges there, once the particle impinges there, maybe it knocks out a few electrons. And then these electrons maybe knock out even further electrons on another metal plate and so on, like an um, electron multiplier. And in this case, of course, the wave functions of the apparatus would also include all these electrons and how their states have been changed depending on whether the particle landed up here when it was spin up or landed down here when it was spin down. And so these chi up and chi down would become much more complicated wave functions. We then discussed the same kind of situation, but uh, in different settings, like for example, when a photon falls onto the cells in your eye and then triggers more complicated processes and chemical conformation changes, and in that case, chi up versus chi down would uh, describe two different states of these molecules in your eye, depending on whether the photon actually did hit your eye or whether the photon went somewhere else. And what all these cases have in common is that 
uh, sooner or later, not only do you get some entanglement and two different states, chi up and chi down of the measurement apparatus, but these states are not only orthogonal, they are really macroscopically different. So they are different in many, many degrees of freedom, like for example, the many electrons I've drawn here that will be ejected uh, from this metal plate when the particle uh, hit the upper portion of the screen, or they will not be ejected uh, when the particle didn't hit there. So we came to this notion of irreversibility. And that seemed to be an important aspect. And I discussed this at quite some length, at least in examples, to make it clear to you that it is usually very difficult to undo this measurement. And the reason why we discussed this at length is that sometimes in simpler cases, it can be possible to undo a measurement. So you would have as an intermediate state, the kind of state shown here entangled between system and measurement apparatus. And you might think, oh, now the measurement has really happened, it has succeeded. But uh, as we saw from the quantum eraser setup in the Stern-Gerlach apparatus, where you put several different uh, magnetic field gradients after each other, you can actually recombine these two different trajectories, so to speak, and in the end get back to a product state where there is no entanglement anymore between system and apparatus. And so that would be bad because then you never quite know where to stop and when to say that the measurement is finished because you never quite know whether interference can reoccur. And so this is the topic I want to take up again now and make it much more systematic than we were able to do at the end of last time. And if you want to give a name to this topic, to this question, it would be, when are we actually allowed to make the cut and to say now, for all practical purposes, the measurement has finished. Now I really got either one of two definite results and I can proceed with this as a fixed result. When is that happening? And we want to do it not by postulating that there is such, some such cut where we have trans to transition to the classical world, as is done in the, say, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum measurements. We don't want to postulate anything. We want to figure this out completely within uh, the theory uh, of quantum mechanics using the continuous Schrodinger evolution, using these entangled states that we can discuss and so on. Okay, but before I go on to discuss the uh, quantum classical cut, is there maybe a small question for clarification already at this point, something that remained unclear on this basic level even last time? Okay, at the moment, I don't see any questions. As always, feel free to ask your questions anytime. So I will now go on and we will try to figure out this very important aspect of the quantum classical cut. And so the question is, what do we want to do? What we want to do is basically to be able to say at some point, look, all these superpositions and entangled states are fine and good, but there must come a point where I'm allowed to pretend that either I have up or I have down and one of the options happens with some probability, the other with another probability. And then from that point on, I don't need to talk about superpositions anymore. So that's our goal, even if it is only for efficiency of presentation, because you want to make this cut and not talk about these more and more complicated uh, entangled states anymore. So I have tried to formulate the question precisely here. At what point are we allowed to replace the superposition this entangled state that is shown here with the spin being entangled with the macroscopic pointer states of the quantum measurement apparatus. At what point are we allowed to replace this superposition state by another description, which in technical terms is called an incoherent mixture, which looks classical like, namely you say, I have either one of two states with certain probabilities. Either I have the state side up with probability alpha squared, or I have the state side down with probability beta squared. So either psi up or psi down. 
And you don't talk about the superposition anymore. You don't talk about the fact that there may be a phase difference between these two parts of the superposition. I could multiply beta by some phase factor and then I get a different overall quantum state. You don't want to care about this anymore. You just want to talk about two different probabilities that add up to one, of course, and two different states and the two different branches. We will later call them branches. So when is it allowed to make this replacement, replacing a superposition by a simple incoherent mixture? And still, that's our goal, still get the correct predictions for all future measurements of any relevant observables. So you could always try to make this replacement, but maybe sometimes you might end up with wrong predictions. You want to make this replacement only at the point in time when there is no danger anymore, when there will be no interference anymore in the future, and when it is completely okay to base every future prediction based on this replacement. So what does this mean concretely when I say get the correct predictions for all future measurements? So to put it very formally, I could say for all relevant observables, and of course this um, will be a point that we have to discuss, as you can imagine, but anyway, for all relevant, physically relevant observables, A, we want to have that if we were to calculate the expectation value of A with respect to this superposition state, psi of T, this entangled state, we want to be able to say this is equal to what we would get if we calculate the expectation value of A with respect to psi up or with respect to psi down and then weight this appropriately with the corresponding probability alpha squared and beta squared. You notice that in general, this equality of course does not hold because if you calculate the expectation value of an operator A with respect to the superposition state, I bring it up again, then you will also be sensitive to interference terms which will mix alpha and beta. So if you calculate the left-hand side, you will also have terms of the form alpha star times beta times expectation value of some psi up A times psi down, uh, things like this, interference terms. The question though is when is this replacement justified? And we don't only want to have this replacement being correct for one particular observable, it should hold for any relevant observable. Again, we will discuss this in a moment. And it should not only hold for a particular time, but it should safely hold for all future times so that I can really throw away this more complicated superposition state and completely replace it by saying I have psi up or I have psi down with probability alpha squared or beta squared. So that's the question. So the question is, it's obvious, it's obvious that it would be nice to have this even just for efficiency reasons, because you don't need to keep track of the coherence between these two parts of the superposition state. Also the description is then very classical like, you either have psi up or you have psi down and this picture will not produce any mistakes in your predictions. The question is when can this fail? What could go wrong? That's the question. And then we will make sure that none of the possible points of failure really apply, that nothing can go wrong. And this is when we're allowed to make this replacement. And the point in time when we do make this replacement safely, we will call this point in time the quantum classical cut. It's a change in our description. Okay. So is the goal clear at least? Apparently, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, then we go on. What could go wrong? Well, I will show you one example where this can go wrong. Uh, let's talk about the observable. I said something about relevant observable. Observables can be any Hermitian operator on Hilbert space, and you can construct pretty crazy observables. That would be very hard to construct experimentally, but they are still valid observables, valid Hermitian operators. And so one thing we really definitely have to rule out here is observables that are 
really many particle observables, so they act on many particles at the same time. They can change the state of many particles at the same time, which is unconventional, but they exist. And which at the same time, they are highly non-local and they act both on the system and the apparatus. So these are many requirements, but what can go wrong if you have such a crazy observable? Well, here I can give an example. Uh, imagine the following wave function psi. So again, we have the situation where we originally started out from a simple superposition of two spin states, alpha times spin up plus beta times spin down. And we coupled it to a measurement apparatus, which we describe quantum mechanically. But now to keep things relatively simple, I say that my measurement apparatus also consists of spins, but not only one, not only three, many, many spins, because we already learned in many examples that the measurement apparatus has to be something like a macroscopic device with many degrees of freedom, many particles. So um, I'm doing this simply because um, I can then write down the operator most easily and can, I can talk about it most easily. Uh, there's nothing special about having spins here, but for a moment, let's do that. So I would have, um, for example, a situation where after the measurement, I have all the spins of the measurement apparatus being up when the original spin was up, or alternatively, I have all those spins pointing down if the original spin was pointing down. It is possible to engineer such an interaction such that this will happen. It's a valid uh, unitary mapping of the original state where the measurement apparatus and the system were independent uh, to the state at this present time. So that's all fair and in principle can happen. And this is exactly the kind of state of the sort that we wanted to consider where uh, the small difference in the system that is up or down of a single system of a single particle gives rise to a big change in many particles in our measurement apparatus. So many spins being up or many spins being down. Okay, so this is the kind of function, uh, wave function we want to consider. And now let's uh, see, let's have this funny observable, which consists of a string of sigma x operators. You uh, remember sigma x flips the spin up to down and down to up. And it acts simultaneously on spin one, two, three, four, five, and six. And there's a product between them. So I really take a product sign. So there's not a minus, but a product sign. So it's a product string of operators. That makes it very hard to construct, actually, but it's not completely excluded. So if you go to a person building quantum computers nowadays and tell them, oh, I would need to measure this observable, they can tell you, yes, it's hard, but I have a way for you to construct this. Now, you can calculate. Now, let's see what happens if I calculate the expectation value of this observable both in the real superposition state, and then I compare it against what I would like to consider, namely this incoherent mixture. So in the real superposition state, if you go through the math, you find that the expectation value of A is just alpha star beta plus beta star alpha. This is because you somehow, if you flip all the spins, then the second part of the superposition turns into the first part where all the spins are up and vice versa, the first part turns into the second part, and then you get this overlap of the two different uh, pieces of the superposition. So that's why you have alpha star beta and beta star alpha. So you are exactly sensitive to the interference term. And that's of course now a disaster because in our alternative description where we want to replace everything by the incoherent mixture, what we would have to do as, as we just said a moment ago is we would calculate the expectation value of A with respect to psi up and multiply this by the probability to have psi up, which is alpha squared, and then do the same for psi down and multiply by the probability and add both of them together to get the weighted average. And it's obvious from this formula alone that the left-hand side is not equal to the right-hand side because the left-hand side has something like alpha star beta, the right-hand side only alpha squared or beta squared. So for example, if you change the relative phase between alpha and beta, the left-hand side will change, but the right-hand side won't. So it's clear that things will fail. If you 
are able to consider such observables, then even this entangled state between system and measurement apparatus, where you have this macroscopic difference in the number of spins pointing up or down, is not sufficient to make this quantum classical cut. You are not allowed for the purposes of this observable to replace the true expectation value on the left hand side by the simple incoherent mixture on the right hand side. So that's a problem. And this problem will not go away. So this is a gen general problem. Uh, we cannot build measurement apparatuses that can avoid this kind of problem. If you are really, really powerful and can build and measure arbitrary observables, uh, then you cannot avoid this problem. In other words, um, when we want to make this quantum classical cut, this transition from superposition to an incoherent mixture, what we have to tell everyone is, yes, I'm going to do this cut, but uh, please be aware that if someone down the line is able to construct this incredibly complex, many particle, non-local observable that acts both on the system and the apparatus at the same time, I will not be able to guarantee that this uh, replacement is valid. And that's simply a fact of life. And there's no experiment uh, that we know of which would contradict uh, this assertion. Of course, to construct such observables is very hard. I, I said, uh, even in very controlled settings like a quantum computer where it can control completely arbitrarily any of the two level systems, any of the qubits, it's still a very hard thing to do, but in principle it's possible. So that's the first thing, exclude these crazy observables. Otherwise you are out of luck. Otherwise, if you can't exclude them, the only thing you're stuck with is forever go on to describe all the world completely quantum mechanically. And that's the only thing you can do if you want to be on the safe side. Okay, so this is the first thing. But let's assume we don't have access to these crazy observables. So our observables, either they only act on the system or the apparatus uh, individually, or even if they act on both of them, they do not involve many particle uh, observables, many operators uh, acting on the many degrees of freedom of the apparatus, then they wouldn't be able to do this trick because you have changed many degrees of freedom in the apparatus but your observable can only say flip one of the spins and then this wouldn't happen. Okay, fine. What else? What else can go wrong? So one thing is of course, the reason why you can leave out the interference term that would somehow be sensitive to the relative phase between the up and the down contributions in the superposition is that these pointer states, as we call them, chi up and chi down, they are really orthogonal. And that's what usually for simpler observables will kill these interference terms, as we discussed before. So you have to make sure that they really remain orthogonal, not only now, but also in the future. And so what could go wrong there is the question you have to ask. Well, uh, the first thing you have to make sure is, or what you could make sure is that there is never any future system apparatus interaction. So that's the left branch. So there are these two possibilities, either the left or the right are sufficient to make sure that they remain orthogonal. So on the left side, we say, yeah, let's just assume there are no future system apparatus interactions. Why is that sufficient? Well, that's the little calculation we had before, but we can go through it again. Let's look at the overlap at some later time, far after the measurement has happened. Now, if the pointer states evolve under the same Hamiltonian, and they will do that, unless you have some coupling to the system, it, it will be the same unitary evolution for both the pointer states. It's the same physical system. It has the same Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian does not depend any longer on the system because if it did, that would be an interaction. So if you have the same Hamiltonian for both branches for the high up and high down and the same unitary, then we just use the usual 
reasoning that tells us, aha, um, if I apply the same unitary on both sides of a scalar product, I can as well leave away the unitary and just um, recover the old overlap of the two states. So in other words, a scalar product doesn't change under unitary time evolution. Two states that have been orthogonal will remain orthogonal if they evolve under the same unitary. So that could be it. That could be a reason why these pointer states safely stay orthogonal. And unless you have these crazy observables that we discussed before, you do not need to fear anything. So that would be an option, but of course, we already discussed that's not so easy to, to make sure that this uh, is really true. We had the simple case of the Stern-Gerlach quantum eraser, where you just send the two branches, the two trajectories through uh, yet another magnetic field gradient, and thereby you are coupling again the spin and the position wave function. And if you do it right, you can just completely undo the former entanglement and you can make sure that uh, the two pointer states are actually identical at the end of this overall time evolution. So you can completely undo the whole measurement procedure in this way because you reintroduce a system apparatus interaction. And so the same thing can happen in other cases. Uh, we discussed something where maybe the measurement um, Maybe the measurement would be done by having a particle fly by and collide with a harmonic oscillator, which I draw here in a clumsy fashion with this little spring. And then we discussed that, well, things could go wrong if you allow us to reflect the particle and have a second time in interaction with my harmonic oscillator. And if everything is timed just right, you can make sure that the second collision will completely stop the harmonic oscillator vibration. And in the end, uh, you have also undone your measurement. So that's a little bit dangerous. If you don't really know the details of your apparatus, you cannot always assume that no future system apparatus interaction takes place. So this would have been one way to make sure that they remain orthogonal. But there's another way, and this is the one that we discussed at length um, at the end of last time, at least heuristically. Um, and that is even supposing that there is some future system apparatus interaction, maybe it cannot undo the entanglement. And why would this be the case? Well, again, um, here now we have to make sure two different things. So that's why there is an and here. So first, um, this comes back to our crazy observable. What we really have to exclude is um, highly non-local interactions. So the kind of interactions where the um, system can interact simultaneously with um, all the many degrees of freedom in your crazily complicated many particle state of the apparatus and say, change them back to their original state. So it would be an interaction that looks very similar to the operator that we've been discussing here as an observable. If you had this, then again, you're out of luck because then you can engineer it such that um, you can undo the entanglement and go back to the old state. But let's assume that you don't have this highly non-local uh, system apparatus interaction. If that is not the case, um, then what else do you have to make sure? Well, um, let's have a little look at something else we discussed last time. We said instead of having only an interaction between our particle and a single harmonic oscillator, like the one here on the left, I might have an interaction with many degrees of freedom because we had already an understanding that it is many degrees of freedom that help us to obtain some sort of irreversibility. So you, we, you would have an atom colliding with the surface of the crystal and then 
originally this interaction is completely local. So you have an interaction only with this one atom in the surface, which now starts to move. But soon this atom will push around the other atoms and soon a sound wave will travel through this crystal lattice and then many degrees of freedom get involved. So after a while, what started out as a local perturbation has become a non-local perturbation in the whole crystal lattice. And that's very important because if you now reflect back the particle, say from a mirror, from some potential, it is reflected back, comes back to the same point. The problem is it will no longer be able to absorb back the energy that is stored in this crystal lattice vibrations because these vibrations already have traveled to other places in the crystal. So what had been a local perturbation has become a non-local perturbation, which helps us to make sure that the local interaction cannot undo the entanglement. And so this is then the second uh, requirement that I listed here, that we want to make sure that at all future times, after the measurement has completed, there is no merely local distinction between chi up and chi down. So it really becomes this kind of non-local um, change and many degrees of freedom, which you cannot easily undo. So that's the idea here. And what do we have to make sure for this to be true, that there is not merely a local distinction at some later time? Well, this is something we discussed last time. In particular, we want no recurrence because you always started out with a local, local perturbation. It evolved into a non-local perturbation that involved many degrees of freedom. But if you had somehow magically all these sound waves reconverge on the same spot, then of course, what was non-local has turned back into a local perturbation and that you could easily undo by repeated interaction with the system. Yeah. So uh, particularly, we want no recurrence and this is where irreversibility comes in, which again is facilitated by having these macroscopic systems, because it is very unlikely that accidentally uh, you would have this kind of recurrence if you have um, many degrees of freedom. This is a research topic in its own right. Uh, it's something that is also of interest to people who look into the foundations of statistical physics, where they want to understand why um, if you start out from a highly ordered state, maybe only a local perturbation, something very special, that in the end you end up with something where the energy is more or less equally distributed over all the many degrees of freedom and you don't easily come back to the initial starting point. So we want the same thing. We want irreversibility. If we, don't, if we do have irreversibility, that means we don't have any recurrence, then we are safe because we won't have a reconvergence to this purely local perturbation. So we want to make sure that neither by design nor by accident uh, we have uh, any recurrence uh, so that at any point in time we want to make sure there will not just be this local distinction. And so again, as I, as I mentioned here, that this is unlikely for a macroscopic system. So now you have the complete, <laughs> the complete layout, you see we have to ask several things and there's no way around them. So there's this thing, don't consider crazy, highly non-local observables. If you do, then who knows what will happen? We cannot guarantee anything. You are not allowed to make the quantum classical cut because it could go wrong. Also, even if you don't consider the crazy observables, really make sure that the two pointer stains remain orthogonal. So either you can guarantee me that there is never ever any system and in, uh, apparatus interaction anymore in the future, but maybe you don't want to guarantee that. Um, in the absence of that, you want to make sure that it's very unlikely that the, any future such interaction can undo the entanglement. And for that, again, we must exclude crazy highly non-local interactions. Plus, we don't want any of this recurrence business. So we really want irreversibility. If all of that is fulfilled, then we are safe. And then we can really, as we wanted to do it, replace the superposition state that enters the expectation value on the left-hand side uh, by this very simple incoherent mixture on the right-hand side. Ah, yes. Okay, so now come the questions. Um, the first question is, 
this reasoning about the irreversibility, is it related to the Poincaré theorem? And the answer is yes, of course. So very good point. Um, so I bring up a slide that we discussed last time. Here I try to plot the overlap of some quantum state. It might be one of these pointer states uh, with, um, with a state at time zero. And we imagine, of course, that the state at time zero is this very local perturbation and the state at time t hopefully is a very extended perturbation. So usually the overlap should be very small, should go down to zero maybe even in a macroscopic system. And the question is whether it ever comes back up like, like shown here, which would happen in a, in a small system like a single harmonic oscillator. And uh, yes, this, this issue of uh, when do such recurrences happen, how likely they are to happen, that is known under, under the Poincaré theorem. So it's basically a question, uh, if, you, if you write down this overlap uh, explicitly and you know your eigenenergies or the eigenfrequencies uh, of the system, assuming the Hamiltonian is time independent, uh, then you see just many terms that evolve at different frequencies. And the question is, are the phases of these terms, can they come back to be exactly aligned? So exactly the same up to a multiple of two pi at any future time. If whenever that happens, there can be a recurrence. Um, and that's the content of Poincaré's theorem that uh, these recurrences are getting more and more extremely unlikely. You have to wait longer and longer for a larger and larger system. And um, that has surely been extended to quantum theory. I would not be able to give you off the top of my head a good reference, but if I think of it, I, I can do it on the wiki. Yeah, so this is, this is, so speak, one application of Poincaré's theorem is to just make sure, both in classical statistical physics and quantum physics, uh, that there are no such recurrences. Okay. So um, further questions. We will see in a moment what it means to have this quantum classical cut. I will sum it all up. But again, so this was our goal to make the simple replacement, then we will be happy because the right-hand side is also easier to interpret. I just have either the Psi up or the Psi down with simple classical probabilities. And we listed the requirements that we need. Okay, so now I want to summarize it. Um, if we now review the situation that we discussed, what have we gained? I want to draw it in this kind of diagram and I will walk you through all of the pieces of it. But basically what we have gained is that we see this picture that during the measurement process, we go to two different branches. And once we are able to make this cut, we can treat these branches as independent and just like classical options, different classical options that come with their different classical probabilities. So to make it more concrete, what I wrote down here, the measurement leads to different branches that will forever remain incoherent for all practical purposes. So there will be no future interference. And when we say remain incoherent, what we mean is, of course, exactly this um, replacement, that we are able to do this replacement. And when we say for all practical purposes, we also mean by that for all reasonable observables, ruling out these crazy non-local observables. So this is what we can do. So that's the high level picture. And now maybe let's go through the different phases of that again. So you started out Um, yeah, so, so there's another good question. Uh, there's a relation to ergodicity. So um, it's, the point is we need here a little bit less than ergodicity. Ergodicity concerns a question like, uh, I start out my system with a certain energy, Let's say it's a closed system, the energy is conserved. Will it eventually visit every point on this energy surface in phase space? 
yes or no, which is an important uh, question for statistical physics, because then you can do averages over this energy surface and so on. Uh, we don't even need that here. Uh, we will already be happy not to have recurrences. So we could, uh, we could live with a situation where we are not really completely ergodic, um, but we would already avoid recurrences. So we need a little bit less, but it's still ergodicity on all of this. This is part of the bigger picture of irreversibility and thermalization. So yes, in that sense, it's connected. Okay, so let's just uh, summarize everything in terms of this picture here. Uh, we started out with, uh, with a very simple state on the left. Uh, the apparatus was still in its state chi zero, independent of the system. The system was in its simple superposition. Then the interaction starts to have its effect, which means the two pieces diverge, which is shown graphically here. And I'm still now describing it as the superposition state, alpha up times chi up plus beta down times chi down. So it's a superposition state. It's also at the same time an entangled state between system and apparatus. That's why I draw this uh, funny figure eight line because it signifies a kind of, there's still a relation between the two branches. And now what I try to signify with all these little arrows is something like the, you excite many, many more degrees of freedom. For example, you kick out many electrons out of your photoelectron multiplier, or many photons are emitted, or phonons vibrations get uh, emitted into the, into the interior of the crystal lattice. So suddenly more and more degrees of freedom become involved. And then it starts to become safe, according to what we said, to make the cut, to replace the superposition state finally with an incoherent mixture where you only talk about classical probabilities. It's important that we had this many degrees of freedom being, being involved, the irreversibility, so there's no likelihood that we will ever see interference again. And one of the things I want to absolutely stress here, this cut obviously is not something deeply physical. It is just a change in our description. There's no physical event that takes place, nothing that you can see happening directly in the wave function, nothing discrete or discontinuous. It's a discontinuous change in our description. Of course, we argued that we are allowed to make this change in our description because of some important physical events like that many degrees of freedom get involved and sooner or later, everything becomes irreversible and we are pretty sure that we cannot go back. So there is some physics behind it, but uh, the cut itself is just a change in our description. This cut has another consequence because afterwards I can just pretend within any branch as if the wave function is really only up times chi up, of course, also the related state of the apparatus, or else the wave function is down, times chi down, the related wave function of the apparatus. So in other words, what, would, what had been a superposition can now be de facto in my description, be replaced by two branches with each of which does not have a superposition. And so this is really, for practical purposes, this is where we have the collapse of the wave function. So in each branch, we continue only with a single wave function. And from the point of view of each of these branches, we can say, oh, the collapse has happened. Because from now on, we can calculate all the expectation values, everything uh, just with a single wave function. And then later on, of course, we remember, oh, but we had two branches. And so anything you might want to average over all the branches, you have to weight the, by the probabilities and so on. So this is the summary of the situation. This is why the cut is so important. The question then becomes where to make the cut and we will have a little example in a moment. But first again, there is a question. Do you need a measurement over all degrees of freedom to see quantum effects or can a smaller measurement do the job? Um, 
I think you're probably referring to when you say a measurement over all degrees of freedom, uh, maybe you are referring to these uh, uh, crazy, crazy observables of the kind uh, shown here. Yeah. So, um, well, it depends on. So if the situation is like the one shown here, let's stick with this very simple example because it's very clear cut and then we can generalize. If you want to stick with this example, if I had dropped even only a single of the sigma x operators, say I had decided not to flip the spin number five, uh, then the outcome of the expectation value would already be zero because the, there would be an orthogonal contribution. You would have to have a, um, um, you would calculate the scalar product between up and down and that would give you zero. So the left hand side would turn out to be zero and actually I didn't spell it out here, but the right hand side is also zero. So you would actually be fine with your quantum classical cut. So in this case, the crazy observable really needed all these uh, operators. But you can construct in principle other cases that are less clear cut. So for example, um, you could say that um, you could make a less extreme version of this. You could say something like alpha times up times, let's say up, up, and so on. But now for the down version, I, I wouldn't take really spin down. I would say all of the spins have been tilted a little bit. So I try to indicate this um, with, with these tilted spins. And what I mean really with a tilted spin is something like um, some superposition of up and down that is not really just down. Yeah. Um, so then there is a finite overlap between the up and the down, uh, sorry, between the up and the tilted version, there's a finite overlap. And the only reason that the overlap between this pointer state and that pointer state is very small is that once you take the overlap of the full pointer states, you get a product of many numbers. And even if each individual overlap is 0.9, then you get 0.9 to some big power. And then this decreases the overall overlap. In that case, I could also do, I could be a little bit more forgiving I would just need uh, this uh, many particle observable A to have, say, many of these sigma x acting on a large number of the spins, but maybe not all of them. Uh, and then it starts to depend on the details, how, how you construct things and, and what you really want to achieve and whether you want to send n to infinity, where n is the number of um, spins in your measurement apparatus and so on. So actually one could construct a beautiful exercise out of this, uh, but then you have a little bit more leeway in this A. Um, okay, so here's another question. Um, the question is whether I'm saying that collapse of the wave function physically only occurs for an apparatus with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Well, uh, not necessarily because um, it, it, it now, it depends is the answer. If I, have, um, if I have this situation where I said in each degree of freedom, there's only a small change. So the overlap is all still near 100%. Then yes, in order to get down to zero overlap in principle, I would need infinitely many degrees of freedom. Otherwise I still have a small finite overlap. Then of course you can start to argue whether this um, replacement that we want to make whether that should be an exact equality or whether you're willing, if, if you're already happy, if this is uh, approximately fulfilled up to 10 to the minus six error. Yeah? So then it would start to be uh, quantitative. Uh, on the other hand, if I have a situation like the one in the old example, where I have up, up, up and down, 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 then of course I can do with even less of these um, apparatus spins and certainly a finite number, and still get perfectly a zero overlap. And then I just need to make sure that I cannot go back, um, that I will not have recurrence or anything like that. And of course there, it does help to have more and more degrees of freedom. 
Okay, so another question. The collapse of the wave function might be not so mysterious since it can be related to the irreversibility of the interaction of the wave function with the environment. Is it right? Well, um, well, yes. So first of all, yes, I agree with the statement. The collapse of the wave function, at least nowadays, is much less mysterious than it was in the early days of quantum mechanics. We know exactly all of the reasoning that I now described. And um, yes, if you want to give only a one sentence description, it's the irreversibility. If you want to then look into the details, of course, you, you have to discuss everything that we discussed. Maybe it's irreversible because somehow for some reason there will be no future system apparatus interaction. Or maybe it's irreversible because so many degrees of freedom are there in the apparatus and they went to a state where it's very unlikely to have any recurrence and you also don't have any non-local interaction or none of the crazy observables and so on. So then you go into the details, but if you want to have a one sentence description, yes, it's the irreversibility that helps us. <laughs> okay, so now a good keyword, is this the many words interpretation? I will actually come to whatever it had to say just in two slides or so. And I wouldn't maybe apply the label many worlds here immediately because it has many different meanings for many different people. But uh, I will make the point that a large part of the modern theory of quantum measurements of which this is here is a description uh, was actually laid out in the thesis of Everett who, and then this got uh, turned into the many worlds interpretation, yes. Okay, so, so there's the cut. Ah, okay. If we have one photon very delocalized, it sounds mysterious how its wave function collapses into one point of a screen. Yeah, now uh, let's, um, let's just try to make it uh, really clear and then you can decide on your own whether you still find it mysterious or not. Um, so let's say we have a photon or a particle, it doesn't really matter, of course, uh, which is at many places at once. Um, but uh, to, to make my life easier, maybe it's only in, say, three different places. <laughs> so initially, the so initially the wave function is, let's say, an equal superposition. And now the places I, I draw as these circles, so maybe, I don't know, these, uh, if I think of electrons, these could be different atoms at which the electron could be. If I think of a photon, these could be different cavities in which a photon could reside. And in the first part of the superposition, it's sitting here, then it's sitting here, then it's sitting here. Now, this is the system state. I leave away the normalization. And it's um, multiplied, it's a product state with a state of the world. Now, what is the world? Well, this world probably, in order to answer your question, should have detectors that can detect uh, the photon. Um, and uh, probably I need three detectors at each of the places. So this world, uh, so I, I guess I have to use the second line, but this uh, world would then contain, um, Okay. Um, yeah, there is a kind of crystal, let's say, at the first position, and also there's a crystal at the second position. And then there's a crystal at the third position. And these crystals are in their ground state, nothing has happened to them. So that's the world. Okay, and, and I only need it once because that is the world before the measurement has taken place. And now I have an interaction going on. And what this will end up, what I will end up with is the following. So uh, I have now an entangled wave function where still the photon is say in the first cavity, but at the same time, this crystal, which was placed next to the first cavity, it has been changed. Maybe, I don't know, um, because of the energy of the photon or because of the energy of this electron or whatever it is, uh, the 
atoms in the crystal have been excited in some way. So, um, and this excitation has really been distributed over the whole um, crystal lattice. So uh, if I want to draw this nicely, I can say, oh, this is excited and this is excited and um, there's many excited atoms. So, um, uh, plus there would be versions of course of other crystals. Uh, the other crystals have not changed because they, they are sitting at different positions uh, and nothing, nothing happens to them. Okay, so Okay, so this is the first possibility, but that's only one branch of the wave function. Then there's the second branch, and now you can see how the story will go. The second branch, the photon was in the second cavity. And now, fortunately, I have copy and paste. So this whole excited piece of crystal is now, oopsie, actually placed at the second spot. Uh, while the other crystals uh, are not affected because they are far away from the uh, from where things are happening, and then you can fit, then you can fill in yourself uh, the third situation if you like. Yeah. So these are the three pieces of the superposition. This is this is as far as we get with a unitary evolution due to the Schrödinger equation. And uh, now what we claim is because this state where all of these different atoms in the crystal lattice are excited is so hard to, it's so hard to undo this interaction and to reabsorb the energy and make the crystal go back to its ground state uh, that we actually in a, in a new step will say, okay, there's one third probability for having the first version Okay, so now, um, which is still this whole wave function uh, plus there's another classical, I mean, no plus, there's another option, one third, uh, the second piece of the wave function and so on. And according to all the logic we made, we said, we will be pretty sure that we won't make any mistakes in uh, any future predictions. So um, you could still consider it mysterious, but at least we know what's behind it and how it works and why we are allowed to make this replacement. And um, if, if you now thought about the screen, these little crystals could be different pieces in a screen, like little photo detector pieces of a big uh, CCD or so. And one or the other of them would have been drastically irreversibly changed and the others are not affected. And this is how we then uh, figure out, oh, something happened at this place, but not at any of the other pixels. Okay, I hope this helps. At least this is the state of the art. This is how far we got. Uh, we as the quantum community. Okay, so let me go on. Um, because one thing I still wanted to discuss here, we said, oh, we make this cut, but where exactly and when? And this really now starts to depend on the physics. And just for fun, I thought, uh, let's go through a real physics example here, a complete example. So it's, it's the Sterngerlach plus everything that comes afterwards. And I try to be as realistic as possible here, even including the times. So first you have your little spin entering the Sterngerlach apparatus. We know that in the first step, because it moves in an inhomogeneous magnetic field, the field gradient will pull it up or down depending on the spin direction. So you get entanglement between the spin direction and the position. And that happens depending on the velocity and all the geometry, but it happens say on a millisecond time scale and you have this deflected wave packet. So that's the pointer state as a deflection in the wave packet. Can we make the cut here? And I would argue, no, absolutely not because you don't know what will happen afterwards. Maybe there will be this quantum eraser set up. Maybe this is supposed to be part of a elaborate interference setup where the two trajectories are sent through different fields and you want to 
measure what's the phase accumulated in these two trajectories and you bring them back together uh, to finish the interference experiment. So it would be quite bad to make the cut here unless you know for sure what will happen afterwards, okay. So then what comes next? What comes next is, uh, this is an atom that is deflected up or down. You want to detect the atom. And uh, well, there would be many ways, but one very sensitive way is to ionize the atom and then use uh, something uh, like an ion detector that works like a um, electron multiplier in order to detect it. So what you do is you come in with laser beams. So this is a laser beam that ionizes the atom. And then uh, this little trumpet-like device, uh, apparently they really look like that, is this kind of ion detector that gives you an avalanche of electrons. Uh, but first, so first you have used the laser to ionize the atom. Maybe this takes one microsecond. The question is, can we make the cut now? And that's already a good question because this laser has ripped out the um, electron, the photon was absorbed, it ripped out the electron, the ion and the electron uh, fly apart. After this has happened, it would already be quite difficult to undo this. It's not entirely impossible. You could imagine a very elaborate setup where the ion and the electron are both reflected. They reconvert to the same spot um, and then the electron gets trapped again by the ion and re-emits a, um, re a photon and so on. So maybe, maybe you could, uh, you could uh, make it reconvert, but it would already be pretty hard. So this would be a good first time where you could in principle make the cut and in almost all experiments, you'd be safe. But maybe you don't believe in this. Maybe you do have a very um, elaborate experimentalist friend and you don't know what they are up to so things could go wrong maybe uh, you're not yet safe but then afterwards in this ionization uh, detector that I already mentioned in this ion detector there will be an avalanche of electrons um, in an electron multiplier like configuration that happens very quickly one nanosecond and this is certainly where you could make the cut I claim because it would be an incredible circus trick uh, in order to undo any of this. Now, really many degrees of freedom got involved and you will be pretty safe to make the cut here. You do not need to make the cut here. You could wait a little bit. If you have fun uh, doing a fully quantum mechanical description of the electron multiplier, well, you can go on. You could even then uh, still describe the electrical circuits uh, that uh, register the current pulse and amplify it. You could also describe them quantum mechanically. There is quantum mechanical description of electrical circuits, of course. Uh, so you could shift the cut to later, but there's no need to do it. Yeah? It would just make everything more complicated in the calculation and there's no need to do it. So this is probably the first time you do the cut. And then everything afterwards still magnifies the irreversibility. So for example, then it goes, uh, um, the current pulse goes down the wires. This is what I show here. Then it reaches the computer. It's processed in the computer. The result is displayed on the screen. That takes actually quite a lot of time, 10 milliseconds. <laughs> um, but by that point, you, you already made the cut long before. There, there's no need to build a fully quantum mechanical model of your computer processing the incoming current pulse, but you could do it in principle. Then the result is displayed on the screen. Uh, rapidly, the photons, the first photons, once it flashes up on the screen, will hit the retina. Then the, we know what happens in your eye. The molecule changes its conformation. There will be a chemical cascade, sending a nerve pulse. Then there will be many nerve pulses. And then at some point, the experimentalist becomes conscious of the fact that there is up. But of course, as we have seen, this is at the end of a very long chain and the cut can have been made much, much earlier already. So that's an example. Is there any question about this slightly fanciful example? Okay, not. 
Well, so then let me try to summarize. Let me try to summarize. Um, I want to compare this modern theory of quantum measurements as I just, just described it to you. I want to compare it with, um, with the original Copenhagen version, say that was uh, the textbook state of the art in the 30s and 40s and 50s. So in the Copenhagen interpretation, you will see there is no contradiction between the two. It's just that some things that were a little bit ad hoc and postulated and mysterious in the Copenhagen interpretation. Now we know how they come about, and that is very nice. And for many practical purposes, the Copenhagen uh, way of thinking about measurement still works very nicely. And the reason is that often this quantum classical cut can be taken very early, actually. So in the Copenhagen way of telling the story, you would have the quantum system, a small system, and then a decidedly classical macroscopic measurement apparatus. And this distinction is very, very important. And the measurement process is completely outside the continuous Schrödinger evolution in this description. And the measurement process on the most basic level consists in a very discontinuous jump, this collapse of the wave function, which is just postulated. It's not part of the Schrödinger equation. And what they then emphasis, emphasize is that this jump, this collapse, uh, this measurement process happens when you have a classical macroscopic measurement apparatus, which is not described using quantum mechanics. So we already discussed, it's a little bit uh, disappointing to have one regime where you have smooth Schrodinger evolution and another regime where you suddenly postulate something extra. Now in the modern theory of quantum mechanics, how does it look like and to summarize everything we said? And this modern theory started with people like John von Neumann already relatively early. So he was, I believe, the first one talking about the thing of the cut and uh, that you can also shift it around a little bit. And then later came uh, a person who was mentioned already, uh, Mr. Everett. Um, and we will say a little bit more in a moment. But here in this modern theory of quantum measurements, everything is quantum mechanically. The world is quantum mechanical. And the world consists of many pieces. And one piece may be the small quantum system in which you're interested, which you want to measure like a spin or a photon or whatever. And then there is a larger piece of the world, which is the measurement apparatus, which however is also quantum mechanical. And so the measurement process is completely described using the Schrodinger equation. There's no mystery there. We know how to do this in principle, even though it may be very difficult because now you also need to treat this big measurement apparatus, which is more complicated. The cut that happens, the discontinuity is in our description. It's this quantum classical cut that I was talking about where you suddenly replace the superposition, the highly entangled state by something much more simple, namely different branches, each of which just has a simple single wave function and they come with different classical probabilities. It's a cut or something discontinuous in our description. But in order to make this cut uh, safely without contradictions, we need this irreversibility. And the irreversibility comes in uh, typically via the many degrees of freedom. And we discussed this at length. Yeah. So what we see here is that many of the aspects that Copenhagen already mentioned, they come back. So there's still something like a collapse of the wave function, but we now understand better how this discontinuity happens. And there's still an emphasis on having something macroscopic, uh, but we now know that is because we need this irreversibility. Okay, so that was a summary of contrasting the Copenhagen interpretation and the modern theory of quantum measurements. Is there any question here at this point? Well, I don't hear a question right now. So then let me go on because what we discussed so far is basically still only a single measurement, right? Uh, one single spin, I decide up versus down. But in many cases, I want to do more. 
maybe I have multiple systems. I want to measure all of them and keep a record of all the outcomes. How should I then think about the branches? Maybe I even do an experiment, uh, which many quantum physicists do, which is I have many particles, but I prepare all of them in the same kind of state. For example, many spins all prepared in a state which has the spin tilted 45 degree from the Z axis or something like that, all prepared in the same kind of quantum state, yet many different independent systems going through the same measurement apparatus, I measure each of them and so on. How is all of this consistent with this overall idea of making the cut and of having the branches and the irreversibility, that's the question. And so now that brings me to another point of discussion, namely multiple measurements. And this is here, it is here in particular that the name of Everett should be mentioned because that's something that really he pioneered to look into this in more detail and, and to be serious about this. But first, the big picture. The big picture is really this branching picture only now carried out multiple times, as if you have a tree. So you start from the left, you measure spin number one, and you go into two different branches corresponding to a spin up or spin down of particle one. And then, so that was the first decision point, so to speak. And then you do it a second time, you measure Particle number two, spin up versus spin down, which leads to another branching point. And then you measure particle number three, which leads to another branching point. And now, of course, the question is, which branch do you end up in? So if you count here, there's always two possibilities. It's two to the three. It's eight different possible outcomes. Each of these outcomes corresponds to a certain combination of spins. So maybe spin result up, for the first particle, down for the second, up for the third. And so you can go through all the combinations for all the two, for all the eight different branches. So that's the big picture you should have in mind. Now, what does this mean on the level of our more detailed description when we bring in the wave function, when we bring in the pointer states? Well, in the simplest case, let's assume we really have, we have three different measurement apparatuses or at least uh, three different pieces of our, say, recording equipment that are irreversibly changed because of the measurement. Maybe, maybe we still retain the same Stern-Gerlach field gradient and we only have one of these, but then uh, afterwards when it hits the screen or so, uh, uh, we get different states. Okay, so how does it look like in terms of wave function anyway? And so, this wave function that we end up with in the true quantum description would contain eight different terms corresponding to the eight different branches. And in each of these branches, we have some combination like the one shown here of the spins that are measured, for example, up for one, down for two, up for three. And we have, as a product with that, the corresponding pointer states of the apparatus. So chi one up means particle number one has been registered up. Maybe it means a certain state of the memory of the computer that has registered this particular outcome and so on. So this chi one up as usual is a kind of very macroscopic quantum state involving many degrees of freedom. And the same for two and for three. And I multiply this, of course, with the original superposition amplitudes that came from the original superposition states. So let's call them alpha one for particle one, beta two for the down component of particle two, and alpha three for the up component of particle three. So there will be eight these eight terms. So it's a now it's an even more highly entangled um, wave function. Uh, which superimposes different components that are macroscopically different uh, by way of the pointer states. And of course, it gets even more complex than before. But we can do the same trick as before. We can say, aha, if we are sufficiently certain that it's irreversible and will never come back and cannot interfere and we don't do crazy observables, then we can say, 
I can replace all this complex uh, superposition state with the many degrees of freedom by eight different classical branches, incoherent branches, each of which just occurs with a certain probability and has a certain wave function attached to it, which of course makes everything much simpler. So this is the way we apply our quantum classical cut here. Okay, so I think so, so far so clear. And now I want to discuss um, what Everett did in his PhD thesis actually in 1957. So first you have to understand this was quite revolutionary at the time and he had some trouble uh, with much of it, even though now you can read through this thesis and you nod your head and from the modern perspective, you think, oh, isn't this what we always do? But at the time it was not what people always did. So first of all, you use the Schrödinger equation for all of the measurement, but at the same time, you also recognize that um, using irreversibility and so on, you may actually, for practical purposes, use separate wave functions for predictions within each branch and use this quantum classical cut thing. So that's the first realization, but you really use the Schrödinger equation in principle to describe everything. You do not pretend that there's anything ad hoc or extra. Then on top of this discussion, which we already had, he also looked into the repeated measurements and he demonstrated some sort of consistency. I can come back to that in a moment. And as an add-on, he even said, I can derive for you the Born rule, that is the probability is psi squared, from rather weak assumptions. I do not at least need to postulate it completely. I can start out from rather weak assumptions and get it for you. So this is what Everett did in a nutshell. Now, uh, first consistency. Um, what you could do is you could say, well, let me just measure not different systems. Let me just repeatedly measure the same system. So in the first measurement, maybe I got spin up. What would you think that should happen if I measure it again and, and I don't scramble it, I don't do anything bad to it in the meantime? Well, everyone would say, well, if you measure spin up, it has collapsed to spin up. So it should then again turn out to be spin up. And if you measure it again, it should again turn out to be spin up because it has collapsed even in the first measurement. And the question is whether this outcome, which you expect, coming from Copenhagen and collapse of the wave function, whether this outcome uh, really holds even in this description where you take serious the big superposition that is generated according to, according to quantum physics. And so uh, the situation I've tried to draw here, the idea is that first you measure particle number one up versus down. Okay, you get your two branches here. And then you measure some other particle too, okay, that also gives you two branches, no problem. But now you come back and you say, oh, let me take a second look at particle number one. Let's see what happens. And if you go through the math, it's not difficult to see that since particle number one is still in the up state, unless it has evolved in some way, but uh, if you didn't do anything bad to it, it's still in the up state, it will lead in this extra measurement to a pointer state, maybe now in a different measurement apparatus, to a pointer state that belongs to spin up. It will of course not lead to a pointer state that belongs to spin down. So that means out of the two possible branches that you could have in principle in this final measurement, only the upper branch will be realized because the up state remained an up state and it will be detected even in the second measurement as an up state. Nothing else can happen. And likewise, if you uh, went uh, to the other branch, uh, first measured a down state, you will always end up measuring again a down state if you choose to measure again. So that's good consistency. And that's very nice because that means in the 
overall quantum mechanical description, you recover exactly the very simple-minded story that you would expect by making a collapse already here after the first measurement. If you say, oh, now I want to collapse, um, and I collapse, say, on up, then you would expect any subsequent measurement should reveal, spin up, 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 up. You should repeat the outcome all the time. And this is really what happens without putting in by hand any collapse. It's just a consequence of the simple Schrodinger evolution. OK, so that's consistency. That's nice. Um, then there's something that is a little bit related to it, but even more quantitative. Um, you can call it the law of averages. So suppose you want to, you want to test Born's rule, right? So you produce a superposition, alpha spin up plus beta spin down. Uh, you measure it and you want to figure out, you want to confirm Born's rule that the probability of finding spin up is really alpha squared. Of course, to do that, it's absolutely not enough to do a single measurement because a single measurement will only give you up or down. It's just one data point, so to speak. You don't get a probability out of this. In order to do this, you need many, many measurements, not at the same system, mind you, because that once you have collapsed on spin up, you would always repeat uh, spin up. That's not good enough. What you want to do is really, you want to prepare many different particles, all of them prepare them in the same quantum state. This can be done usually by letting them all relax to the ground state. You know what the ground state is like, and then you, uh, you change their state by applying some field, but you do it in the same way for each of the particles. So many identically prepared versions, uh, uh, many identically prepared particles that are prepared in the same quantum state. And now if you observe all of them, for one of them, you will get up. For the second one, you will get down. Then you will get up again, blah, 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 blah. You do this a thousand times. And what you expect is, of course, hopefully, if Born is right, that in alpha squared of the cases, in this fraction, whatever it is, 30%, uh, you see spin up. This is what you hope. And so the question is whether this is also the outcome if you do this proper quantum mechanical analysis of all these n uh, subsequent measurements. And of course, if these are many measurements, you get a really huge tree because you branch and branch and branch and you get really two to the n different branches. And so even to be able to draw this, I had to focus, say, on one particular sequence of branches that you might end up with. This is shown here. And this particular one that I drew, drew here uh, would then belong to a certain measurement record. So let's say spin up in the first measurement, and then the second measurement going down, that means spin down, then spin up again, and so on and so on. And I've collected all these uh, results here. And this could be really literally the measurement record. So if you think of a computer or an old fashioned measurement device that prints on a tape, um, then this would be the record. It would say up, down, up, 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 down, 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 and so on. And it would be part of the pointer state. This measurement record, whether it's printed on paper or in the memory of a computer, it's part of the pointer state. Um, and all the different branches, of course, then have different pointer states uh, with different, corresponding to different measurement records. OK. So that's the description of the story. But now let's ask, what's the probability to find such a record that shows exactly m times spin up. Well, uh, since each of these measurements, since each of these uh, spins was prepared independently, so it's a product state. So then I can also, when you do the math, it turns out to be like independent coin tosses. And so you, the, in the end, it turns out the Bernoulli probability applies. So this is the typical Bernoulli probability. If alpha squared was the success probability, what's the probability to get m times success? Now, uh, if you plot this probability as a histogram, you get what I show here on the right-hand side. So probability of observing a certain number of spin up uh, is shown here. This is the Bernoulli distribution. The mean will be alpha squared. That's already a good sign. 
I'm sorry, I'm not plotting versus M, I'm plotting versus M over N, which is the frequency, so to speak, to observe this outcome. The mean is alpha squared, which is very good because this is exactly what we hoped it would be. And not only is the mean alpha squared, but also the spread actually will be reduced by one over square root of N if you do the mass. So the um, probability distribution will get more and more focused around this average value if you go to more and more measurements. And what this means really in the end is, if you have many measurements, if N is a really large number, then the observed frequency M over N will be almost exactly equal to alpha squared with a very high probability or in the limit of n tending to infinity, the observed frequency will go to alpha squared it, almost always, so to speak, with probability 100%. In almost all measurement branches, according to this probability measure, uh, you will see a frequency that is alpha squared, which is exactly what we would hope for according to Born's rule. So the predictions of Copenhagen theory will be true almost always. And that's really good. Yes, at this point, at this point, I'm still using the Born rule. Uh, that will come as a next step then if you are more ambitious and you want to even derive the Born rule, but I'm not yet there. Here I'm still saying, let's do quantum mechanics, let's do the Born rule, and let's then focus on the probabilities. Yeah, but there will be a next step where he, where Everett even tries to get rid of this. But at the moment, I'm still using a standard quantum mechanics Born rule, that's true. Okay, so, so everything is self-consistent in, uh, in each of the branches, according to this probability distribution, uh, you will observe the frequency that you would hope to see. But now answering your question, well, okay, that's all fine and good that everything is consistent, but uh, if you didn't tell me about the Born rule, then why should I believe it? And this is uh, something that Everett also asked himself. And um, he wasn't able to derive it completely from zero, from no assumptions, but from very weak assumptions. And let's go through them. So we know the Born rule says, if, if you tell me the wave function and the amplitudes of different states, just take psi squared and that gives you probabilities. But Everett says, suppose we don't know this. We don't want to start from there, then what? But we already have in our mind this picture of uh, branching, which is purely brought about by following the Schrödinger evolution. And we start from the assumption that each of these branches has a certain probability. So someone, of course, this is something that we put in. So we we say these branches occur with certain probabilities. That's basically the philosophy that underlies the quantum classical cut anyway, that we have different branches corresponding that happen with different probabilities. So let's at least conceptually assume that there will be probabilities. The question is only, what are these probabilities? How should I assign them? Not, not the question, are there probabilities? But the question, what are these probabilities? OK, so. Um, Everett observes that each branch has a quantum state. For example, I, I show here one of them for two subsequent measurements, up and down, chi up and chi down, and the corresponding uh, prefactor, these uh, um, complex amplitudes that came from the initial superposition. So it's not normalized, yeah, so, and that's important. So each branch comes with a quantum state. And the question is, if we assume there are probabilities and we assume we have to assign a probability to this quantum state, how should we do it consistently? Well, it depends on what we understand by consistently. So the first thing we realize is if we are in a given branch, at least the way we think about branches, if then afterwards I just go on with my unitary evolution, I don't do further splittings, no further branchings, I just go on with my unitary evolution, I hope that this doesn't change the probability of the branch. The branches should be really independent once they have been established, each of them has a probability that does not change regardless of which complicated unitary dynamics happens within the branch. So this is the first assumption. 
that we want, ideally, that if I apply some unitary operation on this wave function, for example, the time evolution, then the probability doesn't change. So for all possible unitaries, because I can't know what might be the time evolution, the probability uh, should not change. The probability that I assign to the wave function should not change if I apply a unitary. So now um, you may remember unitaries are somewhat analogous to rotations. Unitaries in Hilbert space are like rotations in Euclidean space. If I tell you I want to map a vector to a scalar in Euclidean space, but it should this scalar should not change under any rotations. It turns out the only allowable choice is some function of the length of the vector. You don't still know which function of the length. It could be the sine of the length or the length to the power of two thirds or something, but it should only be a function of the length. Anything else, any other choice would not work if it should be invariant under rotations. So also here we find that P of phi should be some function of the length of this vector. Now, the next thing is what happens when I split the branches? And again, I should conserve probability. If I'm already in a branch with 50%, and now I split this branch into further two branches by another measurement, <laughs> these probabilities should add up to the original 50%. So uh, the situation we have is that before the splitting, I have, say, a superposition like this, alpha up plus beta down times chi zero. Afterwards, I have alpha up times chi up, and beta down times chi down. OK, fine. And the overall probability should be conserved. So the left-hand side should be the sum of the terms on the right-hand side. Or to put it in simpler terms, the probability of having the sum of the vectors should be the sum of the probabilities. And if I take that together with the fact that I already know the probability is only a function of the length, you go through a little bit of math and you find the only function of the length that is consistent with its additivity is actually the length squared. So the phi phi, the scalar product of the, of the Hilbert space vector with itself. And so that's how Born comes out again. So what get, goes into it is first, you know there are probabilities, you want to assign probabilities. The probability of a given branch should not change regardless of what crazy unitary dynamics happens within this branch. And if the branch splits, um, you should not get any extra probability or lose probability. So probability after the split should just add up to the probability before, which seem to be very reasonable assumptions. And from that, you immediately get the bond. Okay, so I like the thesis of Everett very much. I don't know whether I put a link uh, on the website, but it's uh, really marvelous to read for everyone. Are there any questions at this point? Otherwise it would be good enough for today, but I want to give the opportunity for questions. Uh, okay, yeah, so in the law of averages, yes, the, so to speak, the pointer states within each of these branchings, the, I, I, so to speak, have new pointer states coming in. It's not, um, even if part, physically part of the measurement apparatus is the same, then at least inside the computer where I keep track uh, or inside the uh, ionization detector where I generate this avalanche of electrons, it will be new, different, extra electrons, and it's somehow not the same electrons from before. So this is part of the story. Uh, it would be very difficult to somehow, it would be very difficult. I mean, with a computer, you could imagine that you would um, overwrite the old result from the last measurement, then on the surface, it would look like as if, so to speak, you don't have available the old pointer state, you have overwritten it with a new pointer state and somehow you lose uh, the old information. 
But in reality, this will not be really true because we know that there are many steps before that. And even in writing or deleting something in a, in a bit of, a, of the usual computer, uh, you generate a lot of heat locally and th there will be traces left. Maybe they are no longer accessible to you, but they are still part of the pointer state. So um, it's, it's basically, unless you do something simple like the quantum eraser, it's basically impossible not to, to generate new addition, not to affect new additional degrees of freedom in your pointer state, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm absolutely allowed to say there is a chi one up or down, chi two up or down, chi three up or down. And this will be true even if it's not 100 different Sterngerlach apparatuses placed side by side, but even if it's basically only the same Sterngerlach apparatus, but inside the ionization detector, it's always a new bunch of electrons that are being affected. I don't know whether that answered the question, but okay. Can this classical quantum cut be falsified or is the burden of proof when people who claim a physical collapse? <laughs> um, okay, so very good question. Let me think a little bit. So at least um, according to Occam's razor, we have in postulating this classical quantum cut, we have actually taken the more economical alternative because we just say use Schrödinger equation and we offer you this cut just as a eco economical procedure in your description if you don't want to go on calculating the full entangled um, superposition state. But if you like, you can go on with your uh, superposition state. Um, so if, let's say, the question is, what would it mean to falsify this? So for example, um, if you show me an experiment where I will make the wrong predictions, then it will be very highly likely that it's because of one of the, of the problems that we identified, one of the possible problems. If, and then of course I would say, aha, you were not yet allowed to do the classical quantum cut. If it came to it that you, you go through all of these things and you can rule out any of them and still the classical quantum cut does not work, your predictions are wrong, then I believe it would have to mean you have shown that quantum mechanics itself is wrong, which of course is not completely excluded. Who knows, maybe there are funny situations where quantum mechanics is wrong, but since it has proven right in so many cases, it, it would be very um, difficult. So um, I think the to falsify the classical quantum cut with all the smart uh, constraints we put on it to be safe uh, would probably mean to falsify quantum mechanics. Um, you can ask to try to ask the same question for the physical collapse. Can it be, well, can it be falsified or what? And then Again, there are probably people would always find wiggle room because if I go to something like the quantum eraser experiment and then I say, ha, I got you. You said I should collapse the wave function, but actually I still see interference terms later. Then probably that person would also say, aha, yeah, but of course this was not really a completed measurement. I, I wouldn't claim that you should collapse in this situation. So I think the physical collapse people and the classical Quantum, the quantum classical cut people are a little bit in the same situation in terms of uh, wiggle room. I don't know, maybe it's not a satisfactory answer. Maybe someone has thought this through better than I have, uh, but at the moment I don't uh, see an easy way. At least for the classical quantum cut, I know exactly, I only want quantum mechanics and I offer this as an economical shortcut to get the right predictions. So that seems pretty straightforward to me. Okay. Good. Any further question? Well, again, I told you on the wiki, there's a new problem sheet and I will let you know on the wiki and on the, on the Google channel, um, 
when we can set up a tutorial to discuss these things. Then I would say, see you next time, see you next week. <laughs>